This conference will now be recorded. Okay. So now we are going to see about the temporomandibular joint. So we are uh, go, going to see in this headings, you know, all the joints should be read in this headings only, starting from upper limb to head and neck. So first we will see about the introduction, then types of joint, particular surface, ligaments, relation, blood supply, nerve supply, movements, muscles producing movement, and clinical anatomy. So first we will see about the introduction about the joint. So you know it is a joint between the temporal bone and the mandible. The most important function here is the mastication and the speech. So it mainly produces rotation and sliding movement. It is also otherwise called zinzilemo arthroidal joint. Okay. So zinzilemus means actually hinge joint. It allows only forward and backward movement in one plane. So arthroidia allows gliding movement. Okay. So if you come to the type of the joint, it is a condylar type of synovial joint. That is bicondylar type of synovial joint because you have um, two joints here. Because uh, one mandible only, but it articulates with the um, paratemporal bone. It's a bicondylar type of synovial joint, and it is also a craniomandibular joint. So these two bilateral components are together called as temporomandibular joints. Okay, it is a complex joint. Since it is um, uh, covered by articular disc, it is a complex joint or compound joint. It is the only mobile joint of the skull. So if you see about the peculiarities of the TM joint, actually uh, there are two articulations. So that's why um, it is called bilateral diarthrosis type of joint. So usually the right and left joint, they will function together. They will not function individually. They always, they will function together, okay? So usually all the synovial joints are covered by hyaline cartilage, except this TMG, which is covered by the fibro cartilage okay so and it is the only joint in human body to have a rigid end point of closure that means that you can uh, both the teeth you can keep it in occlusal contact and there will not be any gap between the joints okay so if you see it is the last joint uh, in the body to develop in about seventh week of utero and it develops from two distinct plastima temporal and condylar. Now we will go on to the articular surfaces. There is upper articular surface. First we will see how the upper articular surface of the temporomandibular joint is formed. I think you are familiar with this bone. So this is the temporal bone lateral view. You can see the three parts, squamous part, tympanic part, petromastoid part, and you can see the steroid process. So this is the inferior view of the temporal bone. Okay, and this is the zygomatic arch. It splits into anterior root and the posterior root. So the stunting of the anterior root, you can see an articular tubercle or eminence, so which forms the first articular surface of the uh, TMJ joint. And also the articular surface is formed by the anterior articular part of the mandibular fusel, which is formed by the squamous part of temporal. Okay. So posteriorly, you can see the green color one, that is the non-articular part, which is formed by the tympanic plate. So actually, during occlusal um, thing, the joint will rest in the mandibular fossa. Um, and uh, actually, this part will not articulate. So when you open the mouth, actually, the um, head of the mandible will slide forward, and it will just... Uh, move little away from the mandibular fossa. Okay, so now the upper articular surface is formed by two things. One is articular tubercular eminence. Second is the articular part of mandibular fossa. So this surface, if you see, it is concave or convex from behind forwards. Okay, so now we'll see the lower articular surface that is formed by the head of our condyle of the mandible. So this is elliptical. Okay. So this is elliptical in shape, which exactly articulates with the mandibular fossa of the uh, temporal bone. Okay. Then we'll go on to the uh, coverings of the articular surface. So as I already said, it is covered by fibrocartilage, not by the hyaline cartilage. Hence, it is 
an example for atypical synovial joint okay so if you come to the ligaments like any other joint this joint also has fibrous capsule so inside the fi fibrous capsule you have the synovial membrane the next thing will be the articular disc and the third one will be the lateral ligament of temporomandibular joint it is also otherwise called temporomandibular ligament there are two accessory ligaments spinomandibular ligament and stylomandibular ligament okay so usually like other joints here the fibrous capsule it will enclose the joint cavity you can see the fibrous capsule in this picture so it completely encloses the joint cavity so the joint uh, the capsule will be loose above the interarticular disc and the tight and it will be tight below it and inside the capsule you will have the synovial membrane which lubricates the joint okay now we are going to see about the attachments of the fibrous capsule this is the inferior view of the skull you can see the articular tubercle and this is the mandibular fossa that is articular part of the mandibular fossa so this is and you can see the squamo tympanic fissure here so which is divided by the tegment tympani into two fissure petrospermous and peto tympani and you can see the tympanic plate and this is the stylite process now the fibrous capsule above it is attached to the articular tubercle and the circumference of the entire circumference of articular fossa and even it is attached to this homo tympanic fissure okay so this is the attachment above and if you see the attachment below it is attached to the neck of the mandible below it is attached to the neck of the mandible and it blends in front with the tendon of the insertion of lateral pedicle okay so the fibrous capsule is attached above to the articular tubercle and articular fossa and squamous tympanic fissure below to the neck of the mandible and in front it blends with the insertion of lateral pedicle okay so next we'll go on to the articular disc okay so this articular disc if you see it is an oval plate of fibrocartilaginous disc okay so which caps the mandibular head and divide the joint cavity into upper compartment and lower compartment this is the upper compartment this is the lower compartment so upper compartment is called menisco temporal compartment and the lower compartment is called menisco mandibular compartment okay so if you see uh, the main function of the articular disc it keeps the articular surfaces uh, congruent and it keeps it tight okay and actually this if you see it is morphologically it is a degenerated part of the lateral pterygoid muscle okay so this articular disc i said it divides the joint cavity into two compartments so the upper menisco temporal compartment allows the gliding movement during protraction retraction and chewing the lower menisco mandibular uh, compartment it permits rotation around two axes one is transverse axis and the vertical axis so the transverse axis produces the depression and elevation and the vertical axis helps in the side to side chewing movement okay so upper menisco temporal compartment permits gliding movement lower menisco mandibular compartment permits rotatory movement. okay these two things we have to keep in mind then if you see the attachments actually um if you see the articular disc it is uh, peripherally it is attached to the fibrous capsule this green color one is the fibrous capsule so peripherally it is attached to the fibrous capsule in front actually it uh, blends with the lateral pterygoid and if you see the posterior part of the articular disc it splits into two lamina upper lamina and the lower lamina actually in between two you will have the venous plexus so the upper lamella will be attached to the squamo tympanic fissure and the lower lamella is if you see in this picture it is attached to the posterior surface of the neck of the mandible okay so if you see the attachment of the articular disc it is attached um, peripherally to the fibrous capsule and in front it is attached to the lateral pterygoid posteriorly it splits into two lamella upper lamella attached to squamous tympanic fissure lower lamella attached to the posterior surface of the neck of the mandible okay so and if you see the uh, divisions of the articular disc it consists of five parts okay so what are the five parts 
So it has an anterior extension, which is attached to the fibrous capsule and also to the lateral pericoid. And you have a thick band that is called anterior band. And in between the uh, anterior and posterior band, you have an intermediate thin zone. Okay. Then the posterior uh, band is divided into upper lamella and lower lamella. So articular disc consists of five parts, anterior extension, anterior thick band, intermediate thin zone, posterior thick band, and posterior band which is thick and which divides into upper lamella and lower lamella. So if you see the functions of the articular disc, I already said it makes the articular surface congruent. It also helps in stabilizing the uh, movement of the temporomandibular joint and it reduces the wear and tear of the TMJ joint and helps in the lubrication also. Okay, so now so far we have seen the fibrous capsule with synovial membrane and articular disc. So next ligament of the temporomandibular joint is the lateral ligament. Okay, so this is uh, you can see in this picture, this is a capsule and this is the lateral ligament. So this lateral ligament is formed by thickening of the lateral aspect of the capsular ligament. So it is uh, here also above it is attached to the articular tubercle. Okay, and it extends downwards and backwards at an angle of 45 degree. And posterior it is attached to the lateral surface and to the posterior border of the neck of the condyle. Okay, so this is a, about the attachment of the lateral temporomandibular ligament. If you see the function, mainly it stabilizes the temporomandibular uh, joint and it also prevents the posterior dislocation of the resting condyle. Okay, so it gives strength to the lateral aspect of the capsule. Okay. So that's all about the lateral temporomandibular ligament. Next, we'll see about the accessory ligament. There are two ligaments, accessory ligaments, stylomandibular and spinomandibular. So the stylomandibular ligament is formed by thickening of the deep lamina of parotid fascia. So you know the parotid fascia is nothing but the modification of the deep cervical fascia. So this deep lamina here thickened to form the stylomandibular ligament which is attached above to the styloid process below to the angle and the posterior border of ramus of mandible. So the main function of stylomandibular ligament it separates the parotid gland from the underlying submandibular gland. Okay so that's all about the stylomandibular ligament. Next is spinomandibular ligament. So as the name says it is attached above to the spinoid bone which part of the spinoid it is attached above to the spine of the spinoid and uh, and below it is attached to the mandibular ligament so actually if you see the location it is situated medial to the capsule so here is the capsule so it is situated medial to the capsule it is a flat thin band so which extends from the spine of the spinoid bone and it widens at the lingula of the mandibular foramen and it is attached to the lingula okay so it is considered as remnant of dorsal part of Meckel's cartilage that is first arch cartilage. So spinomandibular ligament is a derivative of the first arch. Okay. And you can see the spinomandibular ligament attachment into the lingula. Okay. While attaching below, it divides into two slits. Okay. And if you see about the relations of the spinomandibular ligament, so laterally, if you see it is related to the lateral pterygoid muscle it is removed here and it is also related to the auriculotemporal nerve and it is related here to the first part of the maxillary artery and uh, inferior alveolar and nerve and vessels also related laterally to the spinomandibular ligament okay so i think you are familiar with this picture so the lateral relations of the spinomandibular ligament are lateral pterygoid muscle auriculotemporal nerve okay then first part of maxillary artery will come here. The next will be the inferior alveolar nerve and vessels. So this in, uh, spinomandibular ligament, it acts as an important landmark for inferior alveolar nerve block. Okay. And if you see the relations of the medial relations of the spinomandibular ligament, okay. So medially it is related to the medial pterygoid. You can see this muscle is the medial pterygoid muscle. And it is also related to the cauda tympani nerve, which joins with the lingual nerve here. 
and if you see in this picture this is the coronal section okay so medially it is related to the wall of the pharynx so this is the ramus of the mandible and this is the medial pterygoid muscle so medially the spinomandibular ligament the green color one is related to the wall of the pharynx okay so clear about the relations of the spinomandibular ligament so it uh, the spinomandibular ligament the stylomandibular ligament and all usually we will ask in sparta okay um, once if uh, the college starts you can uh, come to the dissection hall and you can see all the structure okay so next come to the relations of the joint so if you see the later relation of the joint it is covered by skin and fascia and you can see it is covered by the parotid gland and it is also related to the temporal branches of the facial nerve okay and if you see the medial relation so medially deeply it is related to the tympanic plate so which separates this from the internal carotid artery and internal jugular vein and last four cranial nerves and even it is related to the spine of the sphenoid here and it is related to the auriculotemporalum which goes behind the um, condylar process and middle meningeal artery is also related medial to that and next will be the spinomandibular ligament and cardiac tympani okay so keep this picture in mind and read the relation okay so medial relation so uh, you have to remember the uh, auriculotemporal nerve spinomandibular ligament cardiac tympani nerve and middle meningeal artery and the spine of the spina which gives attachment to the spinomandibular ligament okay if you see the anterior relation of the joint anterior is related to the tendon of the lateral pterygoid muscle and uh, actually uh, a neck will uh, the uh, if you see the ramus in here you have the coronoid process this is the mandibular notch then is that condyla process so through the mandibular notch the mesenteric nerve and vessels will come uh, to the lateral surface and it supplies the mesenteric mesenter muscle so naturally the anterior relation of the joint will be the mesenteric nerve and vessels okay then come to the posterior relation so posterior is related to the parotid gland it separates from external acoustic meatus and you have the superficial temporal vessels here both artery and vein and in addition you will have the auriculotemporal nerve also so this is the auriculotemporal nerve you can see behind the tm joint okay so i think you are clear about the relations of the joint next we will go on to the nerve supply so the it is supplied by both auriculotemporal nerve and the mesenteric nerve both are branches from the mandibular nerve so mesenteric nerve is a branch from the anterior division of mandibular nerve and auriculotemporal nerve is a branch from the posterior division of the mandibular nerve okay if you see the blood supply they are naturally maxillary artery and superficial temporal artery because these are the two arteries closely related to the uh, tmj joint that's why these two arteries supplies the temporomandibular joint okay so next we'll see about the movements of the temporomandibular joint so so what are the movements there is mastication and switch. so you will open the jaw and you will close the jaw then you will do the protraction and retraction okay so now the elevation of the um, mandible is done by the temporalis masseter and medial pterygoid these are the three elevators of the mandible and the depressor of the mandible is the lateral pterygoid which is the only depressor and it also assisted by gravity and uh, muscles in the submandibular region that is digastric geniohyoid and mylohyoid muscle okay so if you see the protraction movement the protraction is done by all three muscles masseter lateral pterygoid and medial pterygoid and the retraction is done by the posterior fibers of temporalis associated with deep part of masseter and geniohyoid and digastric and side to side movement chewing movement is done by both lateral and medial pterygoid even it is assisted by the masseter muscle okay so i think you are clear about the movements so actually if you see the active range of uh, movement of temporomandibular joint is about 40 to 60 mm so usually males uh, uh, measurement will be more than the females 
okay and uh, if it is less than 35 then that condition is called locked jaw okay so usually you will test the um, lock jaw by putting your three fingers into the mouth and you have to see whether it is passing or not if it is not entering then it is an example for lock jaw so usually if you see the resting position of the temporomandibular joint usually the condyle will less lie in the mandibular fossa and the lips will be closed and the teeth will be separated with slight space just try now okay so the resting position will be usually the lips are closed and teeth are separated with light space okay so you have to palpate the um, condyle of the mandible if there is any uh, patient if complains of any uh, deformity here or any pain so by placing a finger on to the outer portion of the external acoustic meatus okay and other than this um, you can you have to trace from the ramus okay start from the angle of the mandible so trace it back okay so you you will end up in the condyle so this is also another method for palpating the temporomandibular joint okay so next we'll go on to the applied aspect of the temporomandibular joint so if you see the applied aspect the first thing the most common condition affecting the temporomandibular region is the temporomandibular dysfunction or myofascial pain dysfunction okay so in this uh, disorder the patient will come with a complaint of pain muscle spasm limited jaw opening and the joint will make sounds when you try to open the mouth there will be some sound will come from the jaw so this uh, disorder is called temporomandibular dysfunction disorder okay so usually this will be corrected with um, anti inflammatory and some um, uh, physiotherapy will help to reduce this disorder okay so the next commonest disorder is the temporomandibular joint dislocation so the most common uh, position of dislocation is the anterior dislocation so you can see this is the normal portion so the condyle now in this picture it's displaced anterior to the articular eminence so this is the commonest um, dislocation is the anterior dislocation this is this usually happens in uh, normally in yawning or if there is any um, injury to the temporomandibular joint or any other diseases so also um, causes temporomandibular joint dislocation if you forcefully open the mouth this results in anterior dislocation of the temporomandibular joint so this can be corrected um, without surgery so how will you do the reduction of the temporomandibular joint dislocation so you have to depress the jaw with thumb which is placed on the last molar tip and you have to simultaneously elevate the chin so automatically it will reduce if it is not reducing means then you have to treat it surgically only okay so next uh, disorder is the temporomandibular joint ankylosis so usually this results due to trauma or infection so actually this lead on uh, lead on to a condition called micronathia or bird face actually so what happen the mandibular portion will be protruded uh, uh, anteriorly and the face looks like bird face okay so if if the ankylosis affects only one side it produces lateral deviation of the joint uh, jaw to the non affected side okay so that's all about the ankylosis next condition uh, is the mandibular fracture that is the most um, uh, commonest thing if a person falls on uh, the face or sometimes due to boxing so the commonest bone fracture in the face is the uh, mandible so in that case sometimes uh, a neck will be fractured or sometimes coronary process will get fractured sometimes the mandible will uh, fracture at the um, symphysis mente into two so these are the uh, most uh, important uh, things in the mandibular fracture okay so with this i'll finish the session
So if you have any doubt, you can clarify now.